Hey everyone, it's Strange Michael. I'm going to be talking about the first Hellraiser movie today, starting off with uh, essentially beginning <laughs> my reviews for the Hellraiser franchise. I'm going to talk about all 10 movies, and then the 11th one comes out in October. I'm hoping to be completely caught up by the time that gets here, but we'll see what happens. Anyway, this is the review for the original 1987 film in this two pack that I have right here of the first and second film. Um, now, this is based off and directed and adapted by Clive Barker, based on his original book called The Hellbound Heart. I've read this twice now. I just read it the other day, and I read its sequel that Clive Barker wrote like 30 years later called The Scarlet Gospels. And then I read the sequel to that, but kind of the intermediary between the two, which was very confusing, called Hellraiser the Toll. I reviewed all three of those books, just in case you like horror and horror books and everything, on my other channel called Mr. Wild Boy 94. Uh, so that's there in case you want to check it out. This is a very short book, and the movie is pretty much entirely faithful. Apparently the reason Clive Barker directed this, or wanted to make it, was because he was so upset with how things like Rawhead Rex had been adapted, and um, I forgot what else. I think Candyman was after this. Maybe it was before, I don't know. I don't remember. I'm not a big Candyman guy, so I can't really tell you one way or the other. But anyway... <clears throat> So I have the whole franchise here, there's that two-pack, there's, uh, and pretty much I bought all of these when I went on my honeymoon about two years ago. I decided I wanted to pick them all up, even before I knew about the new reboot thing coming out in October of this year, it just kind of dropped out of nowhere that we all found out about it a couple of months ago. There's this six-pack you can buy at Walmart for like ten bucks, it has six movies in it, from Hellraiser 3 all the way to Hellworld, which is number eight, I think? Yeah, yeah. And then there's Hellraiser Revelations which is a very, very hated movie by a lot of people. I've seen it one time, and it's been so long. It's been like almost eight years since I watched that movie. And then there's the last one, Hellraiser Judgment, which I've never seen this one. I, I got it, didn't know it existed, kind of surprised. Anyway, I will be working my way through all those, and when I finish them up, as I typically do, I will rank all of the movies, and I'm going to wait to do that ranking until the newer one comes out. Anyway, 1987, really good year for movies and whatever. Um... This movie being adapted from Clive Barker's book, there's quite a few changes, and I'll kind of briefly mention up on those and brush them up, uh, just so you guys know about it, just in case you're curious. It's kind of interesting. The general story of this movie is a little weird, a little bizarre. It's kind of like not just a straight-up horror movie. It's kind of a fantasy film involving pain and torture and sex and all these weirdo types of things blended together. It reminds me of like a Nicholas Winding Refn type of thing that he refers to in all of his Danish weirdness. I love that guy. My favorite director is Nicholas Winding Refn. Anyway, Clive Barker, this was his first time really directing something. And he did a great job. <laughs> he did a great, great job. However, I gotta be honest with you, I'm not the biggest Hellraiser guy. I've, I've just never been. I've only seen all the movies one time through. I've seen this original movie about three or four times. And I've never loved it. I've just never been the guy who's been obsessed with it. The first time I ever saw it, as a matter of fact, was when I rented it from Movie Stars way back in the day when that still existed here in Virginia. Um, Hellraiser is essentially about... Let, let's start off at the very beginning. There's a, a fella named Frank, and he's the uncle of the family or whatever. He's a drug addict. He's a nut job. He travels the world looking for pleasure and finding new ways of getting pleasure. He's done a lot of horrible things, and just in general, he's an awful person. Just a mean-spirited, scummy, abusive, mean dude. Talk about toxic masculinity, this is what that should be defined as. And uh, the dude is a scumbag. I just, I hate his guts, I love to hate him, he's just an evil guy. Anyway, he finds a box called the Lament Configuration, also called in the book the Le Merchant's Configuration. And uh, basically, it's a small box, like a wooden box, it looks like somebody put stickers of gold ticket stuff written and inscribed around the side of the boxes. Uh, it's a puzzle box, and when he solves this box, it summons, and anybody who ever solves the box and the puzzle within it, summons these things called Cenobites, which are demons. They show up, they shoot hooks everywhere, they destroy Frank, they tore him to pieces and everything, and uh, they take his soul to hell, essentially. And one of the most horrific things I've ever seen in a movie is in the beginning of this, when this happens, because by the way, this is a very, very gory film, in case you haven't seen this movie, uh, for some of you younger viewers out there who are coming around to it for the first time, or new people who are coming around to it for the first time because of the reboot coming out. The beginning of this movie, when Frank has been torn to bits, and Pinhead is going around, our lead Cenobite, who is not the lead Cenobite in the book, um, he's walking around, Doug Bradley himself, amazing actor, uh, and he's finding all the pieces of Frank's face, 
and he's putting them back together. And it's like four or five pieces with chains hooked into the sides and stuff laying on the floor, and he's putting them back together to look like the regular old face. It's horrifying. There's something genuinely scary about that to me. It's just unnerving. The book itself kind of clicked, kind of kicked off Clive Barker being a splatterpunk author. And this is a straight-up splatterpunk movie. It is a slasher, no matter what anybody says about it, I still stand by that. There's so much blood and gore in this movie, and that really makes it into what it is. Um, now, Frank is gone. Everything about his body is gone. Nobody knows what happened to him, he just kind of vanished off the face of the earth. He has a brother named Larry, who has a wife named Julia, who has a backstory with Frank, uh, the fellow who was torn apart. And they move into the house. I think in the book it was either their grandmother's house or it was their mom's house who had passed away. Anyway, Larry and his wife Julia move into this house. Uh, in the book, Larry's name is Rory. So I guess it was an American audience change that Clive Barker had to give in to. Kind of sucks, but it is what it is. And Julia is kind of not really in love with her husband. She kind of hates his guts, kind of just doesn't really like him. He doesn't really realize that. It's kind of sad. And in this weird way, it's always made me uncomfortable watching this movie, because you don't really see that a lot in films, unless it's like a, a very direct and non-subtle type of performance in writing. You don't really see this kind, and it's kind of weird. The whole film kind of puts me off just in general, you know? It's one of the things I'm not a big, a big Hellraiser fan of. Um, the second film, I think, is a little too goofy, even though there are some improvements there, but this particular movie, a lot of the time, just makes me feel uneasy. And maybe that's the reason a lot of people love it, but it's not because of the gore. I love gore movies. It's not because of the demonology stuff, even though I'm a Christian. Yes, that stuff creeps me out. But aside from that, the film in general just makes me feel grimy and dirty. It's like a Rob Zombie Halloween movie. Um, it just makes you want to go take a shower when you finish watching this movie. And I feel like that as of last night, or yesterday, before I left for work, uh, when I finished watching the movie. It's just gross. Just the whole movie's gross. It feels gross. The house that they go into is gross. Um, anyway, they don't know that, uh, what's his face, Frank died in the attic. Now, Larry has a daughter in this movie named Kirsty, and in the book she's not a daughter, she's like a friend who kind of has a crush on Rory slash Larry. So it's a little bit different there, uh, but the rest of the story is pretty much identical to the book, The Hellbound Heart. To me, personally, years ago I would have told you that I think Hellbound Heart is a better version of Hellraiser. But at this point in my life, watching this movie, as much as I think Hellbound Heart is a solid read, I think Hellraiser is Clive Barker's perfected version of that original book and that original story that he wrote. That's my personal opinion. I think this is a better version of that book. And the main reason for that is making Kirsty not just be some rando stranger that's involved in this move to help Larry and Julia move into their house. Uh, Julia, or Kirsty, excuse me, is played by, I think it's Ashley Lawrence, and she's just beautiful, beautiful woman. Fantastic actress in this. I think she did a really solid job, as well did the lady named playing Julia. Um, I don't know her. I think her name is Claire Higgins or something. She's fantastic in this. She does a really great job, and her performance, just in general, the little subtleties, again, are what really make her stand out. The fellow playing Lori is or Larry is good. I just blended Larry and Rory into one name, Lori. He's a girl now. Um, <laughs> I really liked all of the cast for this. Even in minor roles, these people are good. Even like the Cenobites who don't talk, that aren't Penhead, they're good. Uh, but Doug Bradley, playing Penhead, it's amazing. You can't get better than that. He's phenomenal. He played in this role for like eight movies. I don't know how long that was. I think it was like 15 years or 20 years worth of movies that he played this character. He was great in every single one of them. He's the only thing that's good in any of them, pretty much. Um, from what I remember, it's been a while. Anyway, getting back to the story, though. Uh, when they're moving in... Larry accidentally scrapes his hand on a nail going up the wall and blood gets all over the floor and for some reason this blood landing in the area of the house it goes on the floorboards and it happens to supernaturally develop Frank to come back and the Frank coming back scene, the resurrection scene for him is horrifying. It's genuinely one of the scariest things I've ever seen in a movie. It creeps me out. <laughs> deeply in a really weird subconscious way. Again, it adds to that grossness. Um, the special effects for that scene are amazing. The special effects in general in this movie are amazing, but that particular scene, it's unparalleled in almost anything that came out in the 80s, in my opinion. It's, it's shockingly great for this movie. Um, that's really all I want to tell you for story-wise, but Frank basically comes back. Um, he wants Julia to help him out with coming back in a very 
uh, bloodshed way, in a very murderous way. And it develops from there. And you can probably guess the general story from that point on. I'm not going to tell you too much, but it's fascinating. It's a fascinating concept that I don't really think I love in execution. Not because I really have any nitpicks about it, I just don't love the movie, you know? Like a lot of people do. A lot of people think Hellraiser 1 and Hellbound Hellraiser 2 are the best of the franchise. I don't have that opinion. I have another movie in the franchise that I think is the best for me personally, for my kind of taste. I'll get there later on when I review it, but um, this movie is very well made. I don't want you to think it's not, especially for an 87 film. And from what I understand, it was kind of like a reasonably budgeted movie. It wasn't high budget or anything. And it kind of, to save money, is kind of filmed in just one location a lot of the time. Not just like one room, but in that house. A lot of the movie takes place in that house because of the family drama and everything. Um, I think it works very well. And I think the performances all around are very good. I think the casting around everyone is really, really good. Um, one of my favorite things is the designs of the Cenobites. I think that... The goofiest thing about them are the BDSM costumes. I've never been a fan of that. I'll probably bring that up in every single review from this point on, but for me, I've never been a fan of that. Um, the designs of them, like the one lady with the with the weird ring thing through her mouth, and then you have like uh, the chatterer with the big old teeth and no face. That's scary. And then you have this really goofy dude that's supposed to represent gluttony. He's just a fat Cenobite with sunglasses. And to me... It just doesn't work for this movie. It, every time I see him, I laugh, especially in the finale of the movie. He's just goofy looking. I just don't like that design. Uh, and I'm glad that in change, compared to the book, we made Pinhead the lead Cenobite. He's the most fascinating version of that character in the book, especially in Scarlet Gospels. But having him here, he's genuinely scary. <laughs> like, he's really, really creepy. Uh, Doug Bradley, again, shines through that role. He is the highlight of the movie. I stand by that. As good as everybody else is, like Claire Higgins, like Ashley Lawrence, um, Doug Bradley is amazing in it, just plain and simple. The writing for the film, for me, is... It's kind of a meandering movie in general, but it's purposely supposed to be like that. So that's fine. You know, I don't really have an issue with that. But again, it kind of slows the pace down a little bit. Even though it's only an hour and a half, the movie always feels longer to me, especially when you hit the hour-long mark. I always feel like it should be over soon, and it just keeps going, you know? It's weird to me how the film feels like that, but it doesn't feel like it's really a pacing issue more so than just me seeing this movie three or four times now. I'm just not in love with it, as you can tell. It's just very... Um, it's just above average for me as a movie. Uh, the look of it's good. The CGI, we don't really have any in here, but the practical effects is what I meant to say. <laughs> I'm looking at my list I have beside my tripod here. The practical effects again, I've said, are amazing. In pretty much every scene in the film, there is one scene towards the end of the movie, I think a lot of people really talk about this, it's a little goofy. Uh, the film doesn't just have straight-up practical effects, you also have, like, hand-drawn CGI-type stuff, so it's not really CGI, but uh, you'll have things like lightning, for example, that are very clearly hand-drawn, like pretty much every 80s film had, and that looks fine. I think it kind of adds a charm to this movie, because I love 1980s movies, even though I was born in the 90s, um, I didn't grow up on things like this, but I appreciate that when I see it, because I know it took time to do it. Um, all that's nice. Now, the music. The music is one of the most standout things about this franchise because of these first two movies. The music is very opera-esque. It's very bombastic. It, it's just kind of... A, it's very haunting, but it's also kind of adding to what I think is my biggest issue of this movie that I forgot to mention. I'm glad I just thought of this now because of the music section on my list of things to talk about in each review. The movie for me, I think a lot of the time, what it is for me that it misses out on, that while it doesn't miss out on, it's too much of it in my opinion, it feels very soap opera-esque. Have you ever noticed that? It almost feels like a horror opera. Not even just a soap opera, but like an opera. The soap opera part comes in with the family drama stuff. But to me, it feels like a straight-up opera. Between the music and the execution of adding that music to different scenes of the film. But it just it doesn't land for me. And I've always felt that way. And I feel like I'm, I'm the outcast for feeling that way. And when you guys see my reviews later on, or you see my rankings later on of these movies... You're probably going to hate my guts even more. The Hellraiser community is going to hate me <laughs> deeply uh, because I have very, very odd opinions about this franchise. Anyway, Hellraiser, the original movie, what do I have to rate this movie as? It's kind of hard for me to, to decide a lot of the time. I try to take into account when something's well made versus when I'm entertained by it and how entertained I am by something. And I try to blend that together and really give something that's kind of an honest opinion with a lot of things taken into consideration. This original movie is very well made, as I said. 
I'm just not in love with it. I've never been in love with it. It's kind of like, um, I'm like Lord of the Rings. I'm not a Lord of the Rings guy at all. Um, as a matter of fact, I like The Hobbit, at least the first and second one. I haven't seen the third one yet. Uh, I like those better than I like Lord of the Rings, even though I will acknowledge that Lord of the Rings, the Peter Jackson trilogy, are more uh, well-made. They're better films, just in general, in my opinion. But I like a lot of other stuff way more. I just can't enjoy Lord of the Rings. I don't know why. I'm not a fantasy guy. Maybe that's one of the reasons this rubs me the wrong way, too, as a franchise, mainly these first two, because they're very fantasy-like. If you like that kind of thing, it's going to be more up your alley. If you're not into that kind of thing, it's going to be more like my opinion. I think it's just kind of a, a well-made, kind of above-average movie, and that's really it. When it comes to the original Hellraiser, if I had to rate this film on a five-star basis, and if I'm being honest with you, and all the things I've said and taken it into account, in my personal opinion, I'd give it a three out of five stars. I'm not in love with it. I hope that doesn't seem too low. To me, that's still a positive review. I try to restate that every time I give something a three out of five. If it really deserves closer to a four, and I think this one kind of does, but it doesn't land there for me. A four for me is really something that I love, but it has severe enough flaws that it kind of lowers my opinion on that a little bit. But overall, I think it's a well-made flick, and I recommend it to you if you want something different to watch that you haven't seen, because I promise you, you've never seen anything like this. It hasn't even really influenced the horror world as much as I thought it would. Uh, looking in hindsight at a lot of horror movies I've seen since 87 and onward, it's kind of shocking that it didn't influence more things, or get rip-offs or anything like that. Halloween got rip-offs. Friday the 13th got rip-offs like Bloody Murder 1 and 2. Nightmare on Elm Street films have some rip-offs in the world of, like, Goosebumps. There's some Goosebumps books that are basically Freddy Krueger doing stuff. Um, you have rip-offs of all these big horror films. Uh, Chucky from Child's Play. You have a lot of things like that, but you don't have a rip-off of Hellraiser or Pinhead, or anything like that. How bizarre is that? You ever notice that? Anyway, three out of five stars for me. Sorry for such a rambly review. I just really wanted to get in depth on my problems with this movie, and also some of the book stuff. But anyway, have you read The Hellbound Heart? Do you love that? Have you seen this movie? Do you love this? I feel like a lot of fans in the comments will say yes. Um, is this your favorite of the Hellraiser franchise? I'd love to hear that as well down below. Are you excited for the reboot is the real big question I have for people who consider this, and maybe even part two, to be their favorites. Um, again, it's not a remake. From what I understand, it's called a reboot. It's going to be rebooting the franchise, doing something a little bit different with it. And I'm very, very curious for it. I'm looking forward to it. So anyway, I hope you'll tune in for the other reviews for the Hellraiser franchise, and I feel like this is going to be one of those things like the Scream reviews I did, where uh, people are pissed because I like Scream 3 more than I like Scream 2. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, what are your thoughts, guys? Put them down in the comment section down below. Thank you for watching, guys. God bless you all, and goodbye.